Um, so I am Oang. Uh, I'm a grad student slash postdoc in this lab. <laughs> um, and then I am taking over Ben's uh, lab laptop right now. And uh, uh, I will um, want to make this presentation as a BCL 101. Um, so to help you guys um, navigate through the BCL command uh, syntax and then how to access documentation for uh, it's, um, for, uh, for application inside BCL. So, um, and, and, and one thing is like, feel free to open the terminal and then run BCL um, along uh, my presentation uh, just to explore the documentation inside BCL. And if you have any question, I, I will take question, you know, like through chat or at the end of the workshop. All right, so BCL 101. Um, and uh, first to, you know, run BCL, um, you run bcl.e6e. Um, and, and then uh, when you run it, uh, it's gonna, you know, like show the version of BCL. And then uh, it's gonna show you uh, um, a list of application group uh, and the list of application each, uh, in each uh, group. Um, so BCL have different application and then different application are organized in different groups. Um, and uh, and uh, the um, and to see the um, the documentation, the explanation, um, and the list of uh, application in each group, uh, you can um, type the name bcl.exe, and then um, the the name of group. So for example, we use the name of group as a model. And then we uh, um, we type uh, uh, help. And then um, so um, the the out output you will see uh, we have the list um, of the, the application in that group, and then the um, um, the explanation of the uh, um, of what the uh, individual application do. So here, uh, the name of group is model. So uh, this is a group of application that primarily um, used for creating machine learning models. And then there are individual application inside this group that um, there are um, mainly machine learning based um, and uh, QSAR, chem informatics uh, functionality in BCL. And then for example, after you, you know, like uh, look through the list of application in the group model and you uh, uh, found that like a, a application that you want to use. Um, for example, the application is trained, um, the model trained here um, is application that train a, uh, a machine learning model. And then you wonder like what's the documentation of this uh, model train application and you add the flag dash dash help at the end, and then it's gonna show you um, the uh, first is the name of, of the application, and then the general usage of this application. Um, there are optional parameter and train, so different flag, and we're gonna go over it in the next slides. Um, um, and and then. Uh, here, um, oh sorry, and then the application can be further explored by passing help op option to the op application that we see here, and then you're gonna see, you know, like a, a window of the different um, uh, part of the documentation of the application parameter, um, and the uh, different, you know. Um, uh, option for the, for the particular argument that um, of, of this uh, of those parameters, and then you're gonna. Uh, so I highlighted the applica applicability domain cohonen here uh, because in the next slide we're gonna go in, into this option, um, this parameter. Um, however, just uh, just keep exploring the model dot train documentation 
through the flag head first. And then uh, the, the parameter, you can see that there are two kinds of parameters. So, so the first parameter is a, um, is a BCL flag. So, so this is the, the general um, set of flags that affect general, like, uh, general multiple BCL um, application. So normally in, in every, um, in most of the uh, BCL um, ab application, you will see this set of the, um, the, the flags that are shared among application. Uh, and then under that, you will see a set of um, flags that is specific for the BCL model train application. So here they have like MAC minutes, MAC iteration, um, and then different flags that are specific for the application. Um, and then the explanation of the of, of those flags and then what the possible uh, kind of uh, value that those flags take. Um, and, and then come, come back to applicability domain cohonen that I showed you before. Um, so for example, uh, after you read through the parameter list of BCL model model dot train, right? Um, and, and then you want to build a, a, a applicability do domain uh, models that are based on a cohonen map, uh, which is a, um, a unsupervised uh, clustering um, cell, organize, um, cell organizing map. Um, and then um, you can um, also access the documentary um, documentation of this particular option, which is the applicability domain cohonen and open parenthesis help close parenthesis. And, and make sure that, that you put the whole phrase in the single quote. Um, so, so, so the terminal command line can uh, can interpret it, um, and then uh, and after you you type this command, you're gonna see um, different. Um, so the first is an explanation of of what this option gonna gonna build for you, and it's build a component map uh, applicability domain models, and then also they uh, give you the the default option for this model. And, and then if you go further down, they're gonna have uh, explained different option that this particular applicability domain component um, model can take in. So it's shuffle, balance, balance mass repeat, balance target ratio, uh, object function, and then they also explain uh, what its option is, and then um, what type of value that its option uh, take. Um, yeah, and uh, that is it for BCL syntax. And I hope that you're gonna, you know, like have fun in the next seven days reading all the wonderful BCL documentation. <laughs> and have fun with BCL and drug discovery and. Uh, um, I, um, I, I will take any question if you guys have. Yeah, feel free to. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> or, and, and then, you know, later in the tutorial, you will have a chance to explore all the documentation of BCL2. So this is the only form of documentation of BCL that that you guys can have access to because we don't have a, a, a online website that has this documentation. Yeah, uh, and I will return back to Ben. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Um, so thank you, Owen, for, for giving the presentation on BCL syntax. Um, and so as you guys may have noticed, um, and as, as point, point pointed out at the end, um, we don't have a lot of external documentation for the BCL. And so um, the big sort of goal with this exercise is to show you that you can go through each of the different sort of interfaces, the levels, the layers of the BCL, and by successively 
you know, essentially requesting help at the help menu, um, get more information. Um, so thank you, Wayne, for providing us with an overview of that syntax. And what we're going to do now um, is start to jump into some of the, the other background that you'll explore further in tutorial number one. Um, I'm actually going to set up my screen as well so I can walk through you guys on the terminal um, while we do it. All right, um, so I think the way that we'll go through this next part is I'll walk through um, some slides. You can probably see my uh, entire screen right now, uh, which is fine. I'm gonna flip back and forth a little bit between the PowerPoint and then the terminal window. Um, I made the suggestion earlier that it might be good to go through with people some of the things. Um, and so that's what we're gonna do. I think it's a good one. Um, so, so yeah, let's get started. Um, but yeah, let's can you put the terminal bigger because we cannot really read? Oh, uh, say that again, please, Christina. Can you increase the size of the characters in the terminal? Because if yeah. not, you have... get... I can do that. Thanks. Um, is this good? Maybe a little bit more for me. I got you. Is this good, folks? All right, cool. Um, all right, so, so we'll go with that. Um, I'm gonna start with the um, PowerPoint and we'll go, we'll go from there. Cool. Um, so, so the first tutorial is sort of a grab bag of, of goodies. It's, um, it is about molecule processing, handling, and sort of these miscellaneous tasks that we do all the time when we're working with small molecules that may not be obvious that we need to do them. Um, so before I get too much into the BCL, I, I wanted to start by um, sort of talking about small molecule drug discovery generally from, from sort of a high level. Um, oftentimes, uh, we think about the drug discovery process as a pipeline where we have one thing that leads to another thing that leads to another thing um, with a certain level of, of cyclic or, or iterations going on. Um, so before you can really do a drug discovery project, you sort of usually have to have in mind what you want to be modulating or inhibiting or activating, you know, whatever you want to be affecting with your small molecule. Um, rarely does this process solely exist in the world of computation. Usually our biologist friends will have identified some, some protein, some, some other macromolecule, uh, you know, an RNA or something that we want to um, prevent from doing some activity. And then oftentimes there is some amount of work that goes into validating that indeed, if you are to make these changes to the um, target of interest, um, we get the biological effect that we're interested in. So this is target selection and validation. We choose something because it has the potential to be a good therapeutic candidate. Um, and then we validate that in, in some uh, in vitro, in vivo setting, it, it is, it is uh, potentially good. Even though this is this is largely a, a biology-driven process, you can use computation to assist. And so um, everybody is familiar with Rosetta. Um, Rosetta can predict the structure of proteins, um, alpha fold, Rosetta fold, whatever. Um, oftentimes we have a biological target of interest, but we don't actually know the structure of that target because it hasn't been experimentally resolved. Computational modeling can help us with that. Um, more to the point of small molecule targeting, um, we need to know oftentimes for structure-based drug discovery, something about where we're going to have our small molecule interact with the protein in order to have it cause some functional change. Um, and so having some information about binding pocket um, can, be, can be very useful. There are, are tools that um, are available to help us probe where pockets might be that are druggable. Um, something else that might be useful uh, is learning about the dynamics of your protein. So you wanna know what are the parts of the protein that um, are most stable, so that way when you target them, you're not getting um, undesired fluctuations that are preventing your drug from, from doing what you think it's doing. Um, because when we actually go through the iterative process of designing a protein or a peptide or a small molecule or whatever it is, um, it can be challenging to, to sample all the chemical space we need to of our potential drug, the configuration space of the interactions, and then also the sort of the dynamic space that the, that the protein or other receptor can, can occupy. So um, there are a lot of computational techniques you can do to, to start to approach that. Um, where the stuff that, that Jens was discussing earlier really starts to, to come in is, is in hit identification. And so, okay, you now have a target that you've selected um, and you want to say, 
how do I start my process of identifying potential um, potential antagonists for, for this target, for example? And so um, in this case, it's very common to do an experimental high throughput screen to collect some amount of data. Um, you want to identify what are some starting points for, for chemical synthesis, some fragments even maybe, um, that I can use to inhibit my protein of interest. Um, and so first thing we do is oftentimes an experimental high throughput screen, but it doesn't have to be. Um, so, so we'll talk about QSAR in more detail later or quantitative structure activity relationship modeling, which is, which is what Jens was describing. Um, obviously there are other methods that don't require um, previously known data such as molecular docking. Um, we can simulate these high throughput experiments computationally to increase the efficiency of the chemical space that we search. Um, and this, if we're super, super lucky and super, super good, then maybe we can actually even identify a compound or a series of compounds that are active um, the first time through. Where when I say active, I mean having the biological activity uh, that we desire. Um, but oftentimes what we do is we help prioritize chemical space for a subsequent round of experimental screening. So we tell our friends in the high throughput screening core, hey, you don't need to screen 500,000 compounds um, for this part. Um, we've narrowed it down to this part of chemical space why don't we search these 10,000 or something like that? Or, or very often we'll just purchase 100 or 1,000 compounds um, and we'll, we'll move forward from there. Um, and, and later we can talk about some examples in which we've done this in the Milo lab. Um, as Jens has said, we've done this a number of times to successfully identify small molecule modulators of different targets. Um, and when you're doing these virtual screens, there's different ways in which you can actually find your candidate molecules that you're going to be using. You can just look in databases. And so there are a number of publicly available databases. Um, if you have an industry partner, industry, uh, you know, their biggest asset are their chemical data that they've accrued over the length of, of however long they've been in business, um, screening their databases on targets. Um, there are, are increasingly more vendors that have um, pre-compiled these um, virtual screening databases or screening databases that you can use um, in silico to then identify things that you potentially might want to purchase. Similarly, um, you can you can do reaction-based methods where you're actually sort of performing the, the uh, MedChem operations in the computer. Uh, there's a lot of different ways you can go about this and a lot of exciting science in this area. Um, but all that to say, you don't necessarily have to have something that's already in a database. There are things that are made on demand or things that maybe you've got a friend who's a medicinal chemist who says, hey, I can make these compounds. Um, you can go ahead and, and start to do your virtual screening on, on those. Um, if you're, if you're you know, in a good position, you will have identified some small molecule that does the thing that you wanted to do, that antagonizes your target. Um, well, you're not done just because you have something that sort of sticks to whatever you're interested in. Um, the next thing that you have to do is actually optimize that target. Um, and so this is called hit optimization because at this point in the game, you're typically saying, okay, I have something that is a moderate effector of my protein. Maybe you've got a small molecule with an affinity of a micromolar or something. Um, hit optimization is, is frequently saying, can I go ahead and increase the avidity of my small molecule for the receptor of interest. And so this is where we can do QSAR again, using models that are not built around primary screening data, but around confirmatory screening data for, um, for, uh, for the targets of interest. Um, this is often very much a cyclic, cyclic process with sort of the experimental groups and identification where you are getting data, training a model, screening, sending those compounds that you think are best back to your experimental group. They will measure it, see if they were actually any good or not. And then based on the results of that, they will feed the data to you and you can retrain your model, update it, make it better. So this is very frequently an iterative process. Um, hit optimization also includes structure-based design. Um, and so I, I include structure-based design more generally on this part of the slide rather than just docking, because this is where you can afford a little bit more expense in the type of structure-based calculations that you do. And so in hit identification, you know, you're, you're playing a volume game. You need to sift through many, many millions of compounds to, to identify something that looks good, potentially. In structure-based design, generally though, you, you've got slow methods, you've got fast methods. When you get to the point of hit optimization, methods like free energy perturbation, thermodynamic integration, MMGBSA, MMPBSA, lots of different you know, uh, machine learning supplemented methods at this point in time um, can be really useful because usually you have some information you think about how your, your small molecules interacting with, with the target. 
and you're trying to optimize it based on those predictions or, or that knowledge. Um, the other thing you often do with hit optimization is say, okay, I have a pharmacophore. So like Ian's talked about, you know, the minimum set of chemical, functional, geometrically arranged groups that can that, that sort of cause the, the biological activity of that small molecule. You have that sort of knowledge, um, but maybe there's something about your scaffold that you don't like. It's too hard to synthesize. It doesn't have a very good solubility yet. Um, it doesn't have a, perhaps a better way to say it is, it doesn't have um, on the particular scaffold a route towards optimization. And so during hit optimization, you can say, um, build pharmacophore models, use QSAR models, do different types of, of simulations to identify what are alternative um, scaffolds or core, core structures in my molecule that I can use to um, achieve the same essential pharmacophore, um, the same effect. Um, and then after you go through hit optimization, we get to lead optimization. So usually by the time you're considering something as a lead molecule, you're saying, okay, I've got something with really good affinity. Now what I want to work on are sort of the phys chem properties, the pharmacokinetics. Um, and so this is where you're saying, I want to maintain the avidity that I have for the receptor, but I want to make this molecule as production ready as I can go. Um, I want to make it as soluble as I can. I want to make sure the PKA is where it needs to be for wherever it's supposed to be interacting, uh, you know, whether, you know, depending on how it's supposed to interact with its target. You want to make sure it doesn't have degradation products, or if it does, that the that the metabolic byproduct is still active and not harmful. Um, and so, lead optimization is sort of um, an extension of hit optimization. I have all of these things discretized. I have all of them linearized, but this is not at all a linear uh, or, or discrete process. And so, this is um, hopefully a framework that you can start to think about the different pieces of this process. Um, but ultimately, they're going to be to be very woven together. Okay, all of that sounds good. Do QSAR, do docking, do free energy perturbation, but it's actually a pain in the butt to, to set those calculations up, to obtain the data that you need to do those. And for any given cheminformatics QSAR project that I am doing, I will spend 90% of my time sanitizing data. Um, and that is the least exciting part. And I'm happy to announce that that is the part that you're sort of gonna be playing with today. <laughs> which is why this is the, the first tutorial. So these are the things that nobody really thinks about until they have to do them. They're not interesting, um, but they're incredibly useful. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Um, if you download a bunch of molecules off of the internet to train a model, you need to make sure that those molecules are actually like real molecules, right? You can't have carbon atoms that are making eight bonds. Um, you can't have um, connectivities that don't make any sense. Um, so you need to clean your data set so that way it has these sort of valid properties and you remove things that are that are junk essentially. Um, very often times when you obtain data, chemical data, um, you have other things in the molecule that are part of the crystallization conditions or whatever database you got it from. So for example, it's not uncommon for you to find that your small molecule actually also has an ion in it or some small salt or something. Um, and while uh, it might seem like a small deal to have a file that contains not just the molecule of interest, but also some salt, um, it turns out your, your neural network or whatever you're using to train might pick up on that and learn some bias in the data set because, hey, all the things that are active were produced by one lab that had salt in their, you know, output files or something stupid. Um, and so you want to be careful. You want to clean them um, so that way all the impurities in the data are removed. Um, Sometimes um, you want to restrict the type of search that you're doing to, to certain types of molecules, right? Um, there are a lot of molecules that are um, containing toxic sort of substructures or substructures that are likely to be mutagenic or something of this nature. Um, you want to be able to filter those out if you don't want them, right? Maybe you don't care, but maybe you do. Um, or maybe you're trying to um, remove, you know, anything that has a phosphate in it or something because you just don't want to have to deal with that or, or whatever. So oftentimes there are reasons for excluding molecules from your data set, whether you're doing QSAR or docking or anything else. Um, maybe your force field doesn't handle a particular atom type very well. Um, there are lots of reasons why you might want to filter your molecules. Um, some applications are perfectly fine to use two-dimensional structures. Some applications don't even require two dimensions. They just make predictions based on a smile string or, or something like this. Um, but with increasing sort of um, dimensions and in, in sort of the chemical representation of your molecule, you have the potential to gain more information. Um, 
But if you can't actually generate high quality, realistic, you know, let's say 3D structures, for example, of a molecule, um, you're going to be very limited in terms of what you can do with, with the output. Data labels, everybody's favorite thing in machine learning. Um, if you're doing supervised machine learning, um, you need to label your data. This is an active compound. This is an inactive compound. Nobody wants to do that manually. Um, and so how do we automate this? How do we make it as painless as possible? Um, I can't promise that we make it as painless as possible, but I can show you that we have some tools to, to make this a little bit easier for small molecules. Uh, duplicates, another of everybody's favorites. Um, we don't want to train a neural network that has duplicate molecules that during cross-validation get randomized between the training and test set groups, because then you're going to have an over optimistic, even more over optimistic than you normally would with random split cross validation, because you are seeing the same molecule in the test set that you have in the training set. That is bad. Um, moreover, you just don't want to have redundant data if, if you don't need it. So um, removing duplicates, but removing duplicates in a way that you can control and that retains as much information about your set of molecules as possible um, is, is important. And that'll make a little bit more sense um, when you start to do the tutorial. Orientation in 3D space. So some models are pose dependent or real space dependent. So they require that you actually have the molecule and some X, Y, Z set of coordinates that are meaningful in some way. So uh, for example, um, having a molecule in a binding pocket is very different than having the same conformation of that molecule outside of a binding pocket. So those are orientations of the molecule in 3D space. Um, those are really important. We can do small molecule alignments. We can do docking you know, with Rosetta. No, different ways of handling orientation in 3D space. You also might want to, for various reasons, make comparisons of your molecules of interest to other molecules in your data set. Okay. And then, and then we want to be able to, like Jens was talking about earlier, compute features for any given molecule. Um, so, so these are a lot of different tools. Um, these are a lot of different things you need to be able to do. And there are probably a bunch of different software packages that can do different aspects of this. Um, but but sort of the, the benefit of the BCL is it's a, a C++ driven software package that is able to do all of these tasks under a nice, we think, easy to use user interface. Um, now that we have it integrated with Rosetta as well, anybody who's familiar with coding in Rosetta can take the data structures that exist in the BCL to make this type of behavior and write new algorithms in Rosetta with these things. Um, we're working on getting it. I mean, so you can already do some stuff with the XML interface. You can, I guess, in principle, um, do some stuff with, with PyRosetta. Um, we're really working on fleshing this out so that effectively you can have access to all of these abilities of the BCL, no matter what context you're working in. BCL only, Rosetta with BCL, um, PyRosetta, XML scripts, whatever. We want to make this um, as accessible as possible. And so this is all ongoing. Okay. Um, and so, and so there are a ton of applications in the BCL that you saw from mine. Um, and so before I get to this slide, I'm going to, I'm going to skip over to my terminal and um, give me a thumbs up from the back row, Lance Oin, somebody, if you guys can see my terminal font. Okay. Okay, great. Um, thanks guys. So, um, so yeah, I am just um, SSH'd into my workstation at Vanderbilt and you guys can see my screen as Oin walked you through. Um, we have um, lots of ways to access the options in the BCL. Um, and so I'm not going to repeat everything she said. Um, I have uploaded those slides that way you can see them if you need to. Um, but uh, what I want to, what I want to show is where you are going to find a lot of these molecule cleaning applications. And so I just typed bcl.exe molecule help. And the molecule is the application group. Oin took you through the model application group. Um, and so um, model, and actually let me use my personal, let's see, molecule help. Um, molecule help displays all of the applications that we have as well as descriptions for all of those applications. Um, one thing that is worth noting that I, I guess we didn't really talk about previously is that um, you'll see that some have no description provided. Um, there are different versions of the BCL. There's the release versions that people license. Um, which is free for academic users. And then there's the development sort of, you know, what you get from GitHub, you know, the master BCL branch or whatever you're working in. Um, and this is the branch that everyone in the BCL Commons, Mila Lab, et cetera, has access to. Um, there are additional features that are not, quote, release versions um, of different applications that you will have access to. 
Um, those don't have mandatory descriptions, and so they can be a bit opaque. Um, but we're happy to to talk about them if, if you have any questions. And some of them will be deprecated. But anyway, I just wanted to point that out. Um, so yeah, um, one of the things that we'll talk about is molecule filter. And you're going to go through molecule filter in good detail in your tutorial. I never remember all the options for molecule filter. Um, and so what I do is I do molecule filter dash dash help. And like Owen showed you earlier, that will spit out a whole bunch of different options. Um, the use case for molecule filter, the general BCL flags, and then application specific flags. So things that are useful for, for this particular app. And then you can see a bunch of different criteria that we can use to help us filter molecules. And the molecule filter is one of the primary and oftentimes my, my first go-to um, application for, for um, for, for processing molecules in the BCL. Um, and so all of these applications that you see here in front of you are applications that are from um, the molecule application group in the BCL. We have filter and its job is to remove molecules from your data set that satisfy certain criteria. And so you can do this iteratively, you can do multiple properties at a time, um, you can say have to match all of these properties or just match any of these properties. Um, there are different ways you can use molecule filter, but it is an extremely useful little application. Molecule unique does exactly what it says it does. It finds the unique molecules. And, and we'll talk a little bit later about how do you compare molecules and, and what levels of resolution do you have? Um, and that'll make a little bit more sense later. But the idea is we treat molecules as graphs and the nodes and the edges have different levels of resolution that you can view them at. Molecule split um, is a great way to make fragments. Um, you can split in lots of different ways that we'll also explore, but the point is you're taking your input molecule and you're chopping it up and you're spitting out a bunch of fragments um, or even just one fragment, depending on how you do it. Reorder is a way of sorting all of your model models. Uh, uh, excuse me. Reorder is a way of sorting all of your input molecules um, based on some property or randomization or, or whatever you want. Um, compare does what it says, it compares molecules in different ways and properties is uh, one of the ways in which we can generate or compute chemical properties on small molecules. There are other ways that we'll talk about later in the workshop as well. Okay, so these are these are standard molecule processing app. Um, and so, you know, something typical that you might do is molecule filter. You'll say, hey, I've got, uh, I wanna make sure there are no undefined atom types. So, you know, carbon with eight bonds, you should not use that. That's not right, don't do that. Um, gas tiger not approved. Um, something else would be, would be contains mutagenic substructures and then say like, ah, oh, well, you know, I don't want my molecule if it has more than five fluorine atoms in it because that's, it's not useful to me. And so molecule filter is a way of whittling down all of these types of things that you don't want to, to get an output that is helpful to you. And so what's exciting about this is we have a bunch of presets so you can do things like undefined atom types. You can do things like, oh, I want to filter it if it doesn't satisfy Lipinski's rules or something like that. Um, but you can also combine the molecules or combine the, the, the criteria for filtering molecules in different ways. You can combine or compare chemical properties in different ways. Um, and we're going to go through that in some of the tutorials as well. Excuse me. Um, at some point during this process, I will make a pitch that some of you should consider developing the BCL, um, especially as, as it integrates further and further with Rosetta. Um, a lot of these tools that we're going to talk about are very extensible and the only reason why that we don't do more is because somebody hasn't decided that they wanted to program it yet um, but i think um, for those of you who are interested you'd find the bcl code base um, reasonably accessible um, uh, as somebody who was not a programmer when he joined the minor lab i can tell you that it is, it is a good place to, to learn how to program um, okay and so, so some of the stuff that we can do, I'll show you a couple examples. This is something that Jeff did um, recently and, and I had the pleasure to help him with. It's an extension of a project that he did with Sandeep Kothwali in 2016 or something. Um, small molecule, three-dimensional conformers. Um, we use these all the time in Rosetta for, for protein ligand docking. And so in the Milo lab, we frequently generate discrete rotomers that we assign to our small molecule and we sample along with rotation translation space for small molecule docking. Um, and we really like BCL conf because it's really good. It generates conformers that are closer to native crystal structure type conformers than, than other methods, uh, both commercial or academic. And it was actually this particular algorithm um, that gave us uh, a difficulty in integrating into Rosetta for the longest time. 
um, because we used to actually derive the fragments that we used to make the, the Rotomer library for the Confimer generator from a commercial vendor. Um, we no longer do that because we wanted to make this more accessible. And so this was a big barrier that um, was overcome very recently, actually. Um, so yeah, um, so we can generate small molecule confirmers. We can do this at various levels of resolution. We can do local sampling, which is what this is, slightly less local sampling or, or completely global sampling um, where we're just looking. Uh, and so as, as part of the first tutorial, one of the parts in there is going to be learning how to use the confirmer generator because it's a very um, sort of not a not a molecule processing tool, but a miscellaneous tool that we use very, very frequently. Um, another one is small molecule alignment. Um, I can't say that this was my favorite thing that I've ever worked on, um, but there are a lot of different ways to align small molecules in space in the BCL, whether it's substructure methods or property methods or, or other things um, that allow you to um, that allow you to to learn something potentially about about some chemical relationships in your molecule um, and and prepare it maybe for for additional analysis, whether that's with a pharmacophore or to initialize a docking round. Um, small molecule alignments can be very useful. Um, since I realized the splitter might not be very intuitive earlier, I, I wanted to go ahead and make a quick graphic of that as well. On your left, you've got the third generation tyrosine kinase inhibitor osimertinib, which is first line therapy for EGFR mutant non small cell lung cancer. Um, and this is a, a really, really important drug in, in cancer. Um, and so um, it's also a covalent inhibitor. So shout out to Daniel Zeidman and the other folks from near London's lab who do a lot of this. Um, and so let's say you're interested in, in, you know, designing a new molecule and you want to like use as part of your recombination process fragments from this thing. You can use molecule split to essentially say, I want all the rigid fragments or I want all the rings or I want all the chains um, and you can split them out. Um, you can flip, split molecules by substructure. So um, you'll do an exercise later on where you actually remove part of this molecule to open it up for design um, by using the molecule split application. So um, tiny things like this that um, just add a lot of flexibility and customization to your protocols are, are sort of uh, what make BCL a fun place to, to work in. And so then the last thing I'll do real quick before we get started with everything else is just take you back to the terminal. Um, and so I showed you, for example, the conformer generator. Um, if I go to molecule, I will see conformer generator is one of these apps. If I didn't know that it was one of these apps, um, I can look for it in here or something looks like it. I see in molecule that conformer generator is one of the options. I see in here, generate small molecule confirmations for ensemble molecules that are provided. Um, and so I can say, okay, well, conformer generator, that sounds good. And then I can access additional help options. And these are all the ways that you can use it. Now it might seem a little bit daunting to say, well, how do I actually even use this? Um, the very first line gives you the general syntax, so your executable, the application, and then it says, up. Oh, you can pass the flags right after that. And so then all the flags are, are down here um, that you might want to use. Um, and this is useful, but, you know, a barrier is still saying, well, what are the best options? Yeah, we've got defaults, but, but it can be intimidating or challenging to just start going through a software package like this. And so the, the goal of this tutorial is to hopefully make you a little bit more familiar with how to use some of these common tools and make it more accessible for you to, to find new tools in the BCL that, that fit your particular application. So um, with that, um, I'm gonna stop sharing right now. I think um, we are right around 1045, which is excellent. Um, I would like to kick off the tutorials. And, and like I mentioned in the beginning, the way this is gonna work is we are going to be available. I will be monitoring the Slack page. I will stay on Zoom. Um, try to message me on Slack first. I'm still happy to chat over video, but I just want to make sure that um, you know we um, we have as many lines of communication as possible without it being confusing. Oyn, Richard, and I are are helping out today. We're going to help out the in-person people as well as the online people. Um, are there any questions before we get started? Can everybody access the tutorials? They should be on GitHub and the BCL Commons. Uh, there's a BCL Workshop 2022 repository. Um, all of the files that you need are in the tutorial one directory. I should have uploaded all of the talks and everything that you might want to supplement that with already. Um, but otherwise, yeah, questions or whatever, the time is now to, to start working on stuff. So thank you all for your attention and um, 
excited to work with everybody.